Oh, good. I didn't have to remember that. Hello and welcome everyone. We're just going to give a moment for people to log in. We'll be starting shortly. Hi everyone, as we file in our virtual room, um, this is set up in a webinar format, so your audio should be muted, but if you just wanna check that for us. And since we will not be able to unmute from our end, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box or in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring that through the presentation and we will answer as many questions as we can. I see that somebody used the raise hand function, which I can't actually access. So if you wanna put your question in the chat or the Q&A, I can respond to you there. Okay, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kathy Rowe, the Executive Director of New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well. I want to thank you for joining us today to talk about the important topic of caregiving. Um, as you know, President Jimmy Carter has been in the news a lot lately, but you might not know that his wife, Rosalind Carter, has been um, a leader in caregiving advocacy for decades. And as Rosalind Carter says, there are four kinds of people in the world. Those who, are, who were caregivers, who are caregivers, who need caregivers, and who will need caregivers. And I think that sums up very well um, what we're gonna be talking about here today. I know that many people don't consider themselves as caregivers as they help a friend or a family member with their healthcare or their daily needs. But as we'll learn today, the role of the caregiver grows over time as their patient or loved one's needs change. What might start off as simple tasks can very quickly turn into full on healthcare, helping get someone get through their activities of daily living. And as our demographics are shifting rapidly to an older population, we need to rethink our views on what it means to be a caregiver and how to receive the help we need. I wanna thank our partners at Parker Life for sponsoring this series so we can bring you our speakers today. This is the first of a three-part series, which will run March 1st, 8th, and 15th. If you registered for one, you will receive the links that work for all of the sessions, and you will also be sent a link to the recording of each session afterwards. I'm very happy to welcome our speakers today, Courtney Roman and Kathleen Adi. Courtney Roman is a senior program officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, where she works on initiatives related to improving care delivery and financing for individuals who are duly eligible, and that's duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, and those in need of long-term services and supports. She leads a variety of CHCS projects focused on family caregiving, the direct care workforce, and community and stakeholder engagement. Prior to joining CHCS, Courtney was a patient and family engagement manager at the National Partnership for Women and Families in Washington, DC. There, her work included building a nationwide network of patients, family caregivers, and advocates. And they partnered with the Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation at Yale University. Kathleen Adi is the Regional Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, you probably know them as CMS, within the Office of Program Operations and Local Engagement. In this capacity, Kathleen is responsible for outreach, stakeholder engagement, and environmental scanning related to all of CMS's programs. 
stakeholder engagement informs CMS of the on the ground impact of policies, programs, and initiatives. Prior to joining CMS, Kathleen served as the regional administrator for the Administration for Community Living and as the New Hampshire State Director for the Bureau of Elderly and Adult Services in the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Prior to her work in government, Kathleen worked for Genesis Healthcare Corporation as a nursing home administrator and an assistant living director in the state of New Hampshire. So welcome to both of you. And we're very happy to have you here today. And we are going to start with Courtney. So just give me a moment to bring up, bring up your screens. Okay, Courtney, take it away. And just tell me when you want me to forward if I don't catch on. <laughs> yes, of course. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Kathy, for that really um, great introduction that set us up, I think, perfectly for this conversation. Um, like Kathy said, I'm Courtney Roman. I'm a senior program officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Um, and I am going to spend um, my time with you today um, talking about family caregiving, providing some level setting, what family caregiving is, who family caregivers are, the challenges they often face in that role, um, and then a little bit about the work um, that CHCS has done in this space um, and some of the key themes that we found are really cutting across states right now um, when it comes to family caregiving. Um, next slide, Kathleen. So if you aren't familiar um, with CHCS, um, CHS is a nonprofit based in New Jersey, although I'm coming to you from Virginia. Um, and CHS, we work with stakeholders nationally um, to really strengthen healthcare services to ensure better and more equitable outcomes, particularly for children and adults served by Medicaid. Um, we've been around since 1995 um, and worked in every state in the nation. And we partner with state and federal agencies, with health plans, providers, uh, community based organizations, and consumers. Um, to help make healthcare um, work better for people who face really serious barriers to well being. And for us, those are barriers like poverty, complex health and social needs, and systemic racism. Um, and at CHCS, I'm a member of our duly eligible, so duly eligible Medicare and Medicaid, um, and our long term care services and supports team. Um, next slide. So just a tiny bit of um, what we're gonna cover today. So we'll um, start with an overview of family caregiving and family caregivers, including um, who they are, a snapshot of the family caregiving in the US, impact of family caregiving on those who are living in that role. Um, but it won't be all downer. We'll have some bright spots here too. I'm gonna be talking about um, some details about this learning collaborative that we led at, at, um, at CHCS um, for states around family caregiving policies and programs. Um, and like I said, some key themes. Um, so next slide. So who are family caregivers? What do we really mean when we say this term? It seems like it should be obvious, but it really means different things to different people. So, um, uh, and Kathy alluded to this and I'll get into this in a bit here. It doesn't always resonate um, with, with some at all. So for purposes of this discussion, um, a family caregiver is any relative, partner, friend, or neighbor who has a significant personal relationship with and provides a broad range of assistance for an older person or an adult with a chronic or disabling condition. Now, of course, there are also family caregivers who care for children as well. It's so incredibly important and should be lifted up, but um, here we're talking about older adults in, in this conversation. So family caregivers may be primary or secondary caregivers. They may live with the person that they're caring for or separate from the person that receiving care. Um, and they could be providing care to a, their loved one every single day. Um, it could be periodically, kind of on an as-needed basis, and it could be from a distance. Um, and if you kind of look back um, in the history books, families really traditionally lived in the same area, in multi-generational households even. And today, families are really not necessarily living together um, when it comes to adult children and their parents, for example. So I live in, I live in Virginia, um, and my parents are in Arizona and Delaware. So... There's an example right there. Um, next slide. So this is a snapshot of, um, of family caregiving in the US. Um, more than one in five Americans are providing care for an adult or a child with special needs. Um, so that's approximately 53 million people. 
And we'll talk about this more in a second, but the number is actually probably low um, since we know there are people who fit this definition of family caregiver, but they don't identify that way. So they wouldn't really tell us that that's what they are. If you were going to put a monetary value on family caregivers' unpaid contributions, there are estimates out there that suggest it's in the neighborhood of $470 billion. And the majority of family caregivers are women. Um, the average age is around 49 years old. Um, another um, piece of research that has been really, um, really popular lately is looking at family caregivers in the workforce. So 61% of family caregivers that's estimated are in the workforce. They could be working full-time or part-time. Um, and Kathy alluded to this too, this isn't typically a short-term role. So on average, uh, family caregivers of adults are providing care for four and a half years, but increasingly um, family caregivers are reporting um, longer timeframes than that, five years and, and, and much more. So I wanted to point out that these statistics are mostly from the 2020 Caregiving in the U.S. report, which is put out by AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving. It's an incredible roundup of, of research on, on family caregiving. Um, it uh, is put out every five years. So what these are from the 2020 report, and there will be a new one coming in, in 2025 that I'm sure will have um, increases in many of these numbers. Um, next slide. So uh, now that we know a little bit about what family caregiving looks like, I wanted to talk a bit about the impact of family caregiving on individuals. But I do want to stress that many people find caregiving to be so rewarding, a privilege, um, something that gives them a sense of purpose. And, and for many, they would have it no other way. Um, but those feelings of pride can still coexist with other things, um, feelings such as stress, and strain. And there's no doubt um, family caregiving is difficult. It can be even grueling at, at times. Um, it can be very hard to see someone you love decline um, and need support with activities that they used to do all the time without thinking about it. So family caregiving can be truly life-changing and, and with that um, comes with stress. So in terms of family caregivers' health, um, what the research says is that um, family caregiving impacts um, family caregivers' health. At least 23% are reporting that caregiving has made their own health worse. So um, family caregivers are report neglecting their own health. They're skipping appointments. They're not engaging in self-care. Um, they report feeling depressed and, and anxious um, during this new role. There's also um, a tremendous amount of financial strain. So one in five caregivers report high financial strain. Um, three in 10 have stopped saving. One in four have taken on more debt. And this can be a really tough aspect of family caregiving. So for those in the workforce, they may have to adjust their hours to accommodate their work and their caregiving responsibilities. They may also be coming into work late. They could be leaving early for those same reasons. In some cases, family caregivers um, may make a, a tough choice and, and um, leave the workforce entirely. Just they simply can't manage both. Um, and that can lead to lost wages, um, to benefits, and, and to savings. And this particularly, since the majority of family caregivers are, are women, this is um, a particularly um, impactful um, to women and, and losing um, wages in the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of another impact, it can be hard to ask for help. Uh, many family caregivers and, and just people in general, I, I think, will say it can be really hard to ask for help um, if they even think of it. So you don't always know where to where to turn. Um, there are supports and services to help um, area agencies on aging, support groups, home health agencies to get you know some support at home. Those are all great resources, but um, they aren't exactly resources you come across in your day to day life. I think the average person would not know to call their area agency on aging um, to get some help with with their loved one. That's just not really in our kind of our everyday conversation. 
And then even when a family caregiver may be ready to look for support and help, it's, it's unfortunately not always easy to access. When it comes to something like respite care, for example, a family caregiver could be an hour or more from a facility um, that could care for their loved one for a few hours. Um, in the AARP and National Alliance for Caregiving Report, um, it says that only three in 10 family caregivers say that their loved one received any paid help at home. So home health aides, uh, direct care workers, they have um, many different terms that can be used there, offer such a huge help to families um, in giving breaks and, and kind of um, caring um, as a partnership. But there's currently a nationwide shortage of direct care workers. Um, the pandemic put a very bright spotlight on a problem that was already in existence. Um, there aren't nearly enough direct care workers to support all the individuals who receive care or want to receive care in their home. So that responsibility is often falling exclusively to families um, who may or may not be able to really easily take on that role. Um, next slide. So an important consideration also when thinking about family caregiving um, really are some cultural considerations. Family caregivers are um, can have very varied racial and ethnic identities, sexual orientations, and gender identities. Um, and you, there are many communities out there um, that have a very strong commitment to caring. In some cultures and communities, taking care of each other is simply what you do for family. It's not a label or a role that they identify with. And in fact, the term family caregiver does not directly translate in the Spanish language. They don't know what that, that, you know, in that language, they don't know what family caregiving really means. So often using those terms can be confusing. Um, they just don't resonate. They can even be um, offensive at times. So that's why I mentioned that the estimated number of family caregivers in the U.S. is likely low. We don't know the number of people in the country who may be doing this work. And they don't even really know that they're doing it. Um, in addition to this, some of the supports and services in place in the country are not necessarily considering um, diverse family caregivers and equity to the um, to the extent that they could. So for instance, food delivery services are wonderful and an absolute lifesaver for so many families, but they may not be as helpful to someone who's used to, for example, a vegetarian lifestyle or um, Asian, uh, Asian flavors or other cultural traditions for meals and foods. It can be really lacking there. So there are still places for consideration and, and improvement. But um, the really good news is that states across the country are really beginning to rethink the ways that they address gaps in supports and services and, and access that people have to those things. Um, there's more attention than ever on working family caregivers um, and thinking about how to reach diverse family caregivers and family caregivers in rural versus urban populations as well. Um, next slide. So one thing that I wanted um, to mention as well, because this has been a little bit of a downer up until then, but um, until now, but I'm hoping to lift that up here. Um, and then Kathleen will do lots of lifting up. Um, but states are offer a, a variety of Medicaid supports for family caregivers. Um, so of course the person receiving care would have to qualify for Medicaid, which may or may not be possible. Um, but if they do, um, these supports are really work, worth looking into. So there are services for the care recipient, so your loved one, as, and as well as support for the caregiver, and that includes respite, home health services, home modifications sometimes, transportation, home delivered meals, again, with some of those considerations there, adult daycare, um, things like that. Um, some states offer payment to family caregivers. So this happens mostly through self-direction, which means that you're able to choose your um, the provider, the person who provides the care for you. Um, and during the heart of the pandemic, some states took advantage of their Appendix K appendium um, in their 1915C waivers, which is an emergency um, waiver situation. And that can include language to pay um, family caregivers um, an hourly rate to, to provide care. Um, training and education is sometimes available um, with, with different Medicaid um, waiver services. So um, it's, it's usually around Alzheimer's or related dementias um, for those family caregivers caring um, for folks um, with some of those um, 
conditions. And training can also include have, helping fam, family caregivers assist loved ones with functional um, needs, which is really important because sometimes you take on this role and, and you really are not trained um, to take care of someone, as, particularly as their needs increase over time. And then finally, um, care coordination services are available sometimes. That's most often through um, person-centered care plans, um, where a, a kind of a formal assessment has taken place of the family caregiver and, and of the um, care recipient. Next slide. So before I wrap up here, just wanted to share an overview of a project um, that is really squarely focused on family caregiving that CHCS wrapped up in October. Um, the purpose of this project was to support eight participating states. You'll see them here on the screen. Um, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington. Um, really expand the scale and spread and execution of state strategies that strengthen policies and programs to support family caregivers. Um, the phase of this work had kicked off in October 2020 and ended in September 2022. If anyone's doing the math, it was entirely during um, the pandemic. Um, and this effort was funded by the Johnny Hartford Foundation in New York um, and the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. So um, these eight states participated in the Learning Collaborative, which is a really common model of technical assistance at CHCS. And, and so what that means is our team fostered this environment where the participating states could talk to each other, share with each other, and learn from each other. They like us just fine, but they really want to talk to each other. And, and so that's the kind of environment and community that we really wanted to create for them. And the, um, the other um, piece of this that was just really interesting and, and fun, frankly, was that these state teams were multi-sector. Um, so they were made up of the departments you would probably expect for something like this, aging, health and human services, Medicaid, but then they were also encouraged to really bring in others with a focus on family caregiving. So sometimes that was health plans, area agencies on aging were part, universities doing research in this area, Alzheimer's Association, AARP. It really made these very rich teams um, that were more comprehensive and they could share the load of the work um, and do more together than apart. So it was really a beautiful thing to see um, them all come together. Um, and so just to give you a tiny flavor of some of the goals that these states worked on over the two years, there was, um, uh, and it just launched, I'm so thrilled for them, in Texas, a campaign to reach family caregivers in rural communities. Um, there was a survey for employers to give to all working family caregivers, that was in New York, um, a standardized family caregiver assessment across all the state's area agencies on aging. That was in Iowa and in Indiana is working on it as well. And then the development of a really lovely comprehensive guide for dementia family caregivers. That was in Iowa too. So that's a little bit of what we worked on over, over the couple of years. Um, last slide, and I'll do this really quickly, Kathy, because I know I'm over time. Um, but wanted to just quickly go over some of these cross-cutting themes and we've hit on all of them really. Um, but the one we heard over and over and this is across the board, even if you're a state that's been doing great things forever, like Washington or kind of just getting started, Michigan and Indiana were kind of still getting started. Um, it's challenging to identify family caregivers. And um, we hear states say they know there's a significant gap between the family caregivers they know are living in their state and those that are accessing services and really getting help. And so um, you know, there are different approaches to what can be done here. You know, public awareness campaigns, I think, are one is one like Texas is doing. But um, I think probably um, one of the one thing that can makes it a little bit better, kind of puts a finer point on it, is really collecting data. So doing those assessments um, and, um, you know, looking at the data that you have and, and kind of looking for gaps in there. Um, is I think the strongest tool um, that states have really to understand where family caregivers are, why they aren't accessing these resources, what they truly need and kind of using that information to shape things going forward. Um, the second theme is diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, states are really aware of the diverse communities of color in their states and are committed to really finding meaningful ways to reach them. That was um, an area of focus in this project to really get states thinking about it. 
um, and what that means. It's because it's unique in every state, every city, you know, every community. So really starting to think about that more. And then finally, these new cross-sector partnerships. Um, this was a little bit of a test um, in our project, and it, it was just great. It, what we found I think, um, is that the teams could really share the workload and the resources. It feels like a lot all on one, but if you could kind of spread it out, it feels better. Um, it's so interesting to see them kind of pool their existing past experiences, their lessons, their work products. Um, so there was always a really great information exchange happening. And then finally, kind of working toward those shared goals that were truly reflective of the needs of the community because they had all those different perspectives coming together. So it was um, it was just wonderful to see how much uh, the states were able to work on together. So I'm gonna stop there, happy to answer questions, but we're gonna, I know, turn things over to Kathleen who also has much more uplifting things to share. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. And, and again, I am, um... I want to start by saying thank you, New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, and for having this series. It's really timely that we do this, uh, probably over, uh, um, for the federal response, it's really, we have not been as attentive as we should have been, but we're trying to make up for lost time. And I have good news to share with you today. So again, I really appreciate you offering this three session uh, caregiving special for us all to learn together, but also so we can share updated information. And Courtney covered some of the most fabulous and really foundational work that we have done over the course of the last few years as it relates to caregiving. And what I'm gonna share with you today is a little bit about um, the family support piece of this and, um, and how, we are, um, how we're doing so uh, on a national basis. So um, again, I want to talk with you a little bit about the work that the feds are doing. And again, the national strategy to support family caregivers came out last fall. And this is an opportunity for everyone to come together to be able as federal partners to say, we're all in this together. Let's see what we can do collectively with many of the, um, with many of the programs that we have available to us. So um, I wanted to make sure that if you did not know this publication was available, that the National Strategy to Support Family Caregivers is out. It is an opportunity where the, um, the panels that actually recommended this strategy have come together, offered some goals and so forth, and have uh, really provided the federal government with a blueprint in how to study um, um, the work of the caregivers. I'm gonna start again, just again, so that I can uh, make sure that I cover all of these slides appropriately and that you can see these. All righty. So the disclaimer, we need to be able to share with you that certainly as I provide this presentation, that this is something that is current, uh, is subject to change. Uh, but again, as we talk today, these are some of the plans that we have um, come together as CMS to really attack and, and really work together with our family, uh, pardon me, with our federal partners to work on a national strategy to support caregivers. So every single one of us, if we live long enough, is likely to experience being a family caregiver. And why I think that's important to share with you is that I reflect back on my time when I was in uh, New Hampshire, I had an advocate that came to me and said, you know, Kathleen, so much to do about being an older adult. You know, we're all seniors in training. And for those of you that know me, you know that I reflect upon that particular wisdom on a regular basis, because I think it really brings to mind that we are all aging and that we all could be caregivers and that we all are hoping to be seniors in training. So I make mention of this because I think it's important as family caregivers to recognize that there is so much work that needs to be done and awareness that needs to be shared, but that we should start early and really think about the role of the family caregiver and that of the older adult as we go forward. So again, uh, we have 53 million people who are providing informal, usually unpaid care as Courtney uh, shared with us. And again, we're really um, appreciative of the foundation that she laid because it sets the stage for why we needed to have a national strategy. And Excuse something- Excuse me, Kathleen? Yes. Uh, your, your slides aren't moving forward for us. All right, very good. Okay, let us see- Thanks everyone for letting us know. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me see what I can do to do take care of that. All righty. Hmm. 
Okay. There. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me know, everyone. I appreciate it. So um, who are family caregivers and why I think that that is important for us to say is that we know through the public health emergency that many of our family caregivers actually um, really were, were stressed. Uh, you know, that we had a lot of financial considerations to contend with. We had health concerns that all of us really focused on. And then we had grandparents who were trying to raise grandchildren. And that was a real challenging time. I think we need to reflect upon that time because it's helped us decide that we needed to do something on a federal basis to come together and to plan in coordination. So family caregivers are recognized by Congress because there was the RAISE Advisory Council that actually mandated that there be um, a strategy amongst federal partners who provide the source of the funding and the programs to support caregivers. And this came about over two years. The Advisory Council spent many, many months going over what an unpaid individual actually contends with, what are the challenges, what are the barriers, what are the benefits? What are the strengths that are offered as you provide care to a grandparent or to a loved one? So again, the RAISE Advisory Council came together, worked very hard with the Administration for Community Living to come forward with the national strategy that I reference. That's very, very important because it's giving us a blueprint as I made mention. There will be a report to Congress that needs to come forward with all of the work that the federal partners are doing in this area. And again, it's something that is really a little bit um, uh, behind times because we, we know that family caregivers who've really struggled for so long, just really trying to find some of the services as Courtney made mention in her presentation. I'm gonna go back to a slide. I, I did step over this one and, and why I think it's important to do this is to recognize where we've been. Uh, you know, back in the eighties, that's when uh, uh, the assistant, sec uh, assistant sec secretary for aging Jeanette Takamura, who is from New York, uh, actually decided that we needed to incorporate family caregiving into the Older Americans Act. So many of our states really utilize the Title III-E funding to support caregivers in need. But also the trend that was occurring at the same time were the rebalancing efforts that every state was doing. If you remember correctly, back in the day, everyone who was older, who had health conditions, really were suggested to go to a nursing facility. And through rebalancing, we were able to say, you know, people want to remain at home. And indeed, we feel as if they should have that opportunity. And home and community-based services began to flourish, which of course brings us to the family caregiving situation, because we know with more relatives providing care, there were more needs. So we come to the national strategy. And I made mention about the advisory councils, how they're established under the RAISE Family Caregiving Act to really look at family caregivers and grandparents raising grandchildren, two different acts that really want to focus on caregiving as a whole. In the strategy that I've referenced, both of these acts are coming together with concerns and issues that they raise in this national strategy. So again, even though they're separate and distinct needs, we are coming together to look at the problem, the challenges, the opportunities uh, together. And again, we wanna make sure that resources are known. So in, this includes nearly 500 actions that family caregivers have the resources that they need to maintain their own health, well-being and financial security while providing crucial support for others. And as Courtney made mention, that's exactly what happens. Caregivers typically forget their own care needs while providing care to a loved one. I think again, this is exciting for all of us because not only does it bring our federal and state partners to the table to talk about family caregiver resources, but also it includes our tribal partners. It looks at foster children as well. It looks at family caregivers who are continuing to try to work. So the purpose of the strategy is to really look at this whole spectrum of caregiver needs and to align our federal resources and, as I say, uh, programs so that we can look at an, an opportunity to really work together to meet some of the stakeholder needs that we know are available. And again, I think another important thing that is so important to make mention of is that this is an opportunity to bring awareness to caregivers and what they are, are doing. Uh, certainly, as we made mention in my presentation in Courtney's, we know people who are providing care many times uh, are not able to work. 
Uh, many times they are working and yet their work is affected. So we need to uplift the caregivers that are represented in this, in this cohort and to talk about them, to really have a family-centered approach, to talk about trauma and informed uh, trauma, because again, as we do get older and as we are providing care, many of the people we're providing care for have suffered trauma in their youth and with some dementia and some with maybe even Alzheimer's type dementia, we see that happening and caregivers are challenged in how to deal with these, with these uh, uh, situations that they find themselves in. The goals of the national strategy are here. And again, I know you can read this, but you know, really increase awareness and outreach is really primary. I think we wanna also as federal partners learn how we can partner and engage. We also need to strengthen services and support by recognizing the demographics. And again, we wanna make sure employers understand the challenges of our family caregivers. Many times they are affected and the employers need to have an understanding of that. And of course, with anything else that we do in the federal government, data is very important, research, evidence-based practices, but also best practices and promising practices that may work in one state uh, could also be changed and, and, and shared with another state for implementation. So I've kind of given you the first step of the initial strategy, uh, how it empowers communities and agencies and other stakeholder groups. It is a milestone. And I wanna take the time uh, that I have in presenting to you to share a little bit about what we're planning to do out of the region two CMS office that really works closely with New Jersey and New York. As um, Kathy mentioned in my introduction, we are concerned about information making sure we share information, making sure that information is distributed, making sure that people know where the resources are. And again, as Courtney alluded to, that's absolutely what happens. The average normal person doesn't say, hey, I have a caregiving need. I think I'm gonna contact my area agency on aging and get the answer. Now, no doubt they probably have the answer. I mean that most sincerely because they are wonderful. And even our Aging and Disability Resource Center or No Wrong Door Centers are awesome, they have the answers, but we've gotta make sure people know where to go. So one of the things that we are going to do uh, as part of our uh, local outreach is to really increase awareness, uh, looking at social media, looking at the programs that we have, such as the senior Medicare, uh, the, pardon me, uh, such as the Medicare savings program, making sure caregivers know about those programs and can take part in them or have their family member take part in them. Also, we want to implement some of the caregiving modules into the national Medicare training. Again, making sure people have an awareness that caregivers have needs and that they're an important provider and stakeholder when we talk about caregivers, making sure that caregivers have the information for their older adults or children as the case may be. Again, we also wanna make sure that there's provider information related to children's uh, CHIP services, the Children's Health Insurance Program, making sure again that caregivers are recognized as a stakeholder whenever we do outreach so that information is getting into the hands, into the hearts, into the minds of those people that truly need to have it and are, are really lost without it. And then also, um, you know, talking about open enrollment, Medicare open enrollment. This year, we recognize that our caregivers many times are learning about Medicare uh, to help and support their loved ones. So we implemented a, a special part of our outreach to reach those caregivers, those important caregivers, so that they had the information they need. And then also listening sessions. You know, who better to tell us what the needs are than to go straight to caregivers themselves, to listen, to be able to share information with our leadership so that they have an understanding of ground truth of what it's like to be a caregiver. All of these things we can do and those are the things that we have dedicated ourselves to do in this region in the CMS office is to reach out, share information, hear and listen, and then also to deliver information back to our policymakers so that they can make very informed decisions when it comes to the caregivers themselves. So I, I list this on here. We, uh, we really appreciate you listening to us. Um, if you would like to, we would be happy for you to provide a, a information on the information we shared to you today, or I would even say recommendations. If there's something that you would like for us to do in part of our outreach, we would welcome that. And so you have this information available to you if you, can, uh, if you would like to take part. 
And with that, I'm going to say, I want to make sure that you have the resources and also the, the um, uh, website so that you can actually go to the strategy itself. Um, if you have any questions, you certainly can contact us. We are happy to answer those questions. But again, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I thank Kathy and her team for making this possible for Courtney and I to speak with you today and uh, to share information from the federal perspective as well as the, the ground truth uh, that Courtney's provided. So Kathy, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you both. Um, we did have a couple of questions coming in and Courtney answered some. I also had a, a question that was emailed beforehand that um, I know it's gonna be hard to answer because there's not one right way to do this, but um, someone asked how they talk to their, and we're gonna bring this up at our next session next week too, but how to talk about their care receivers condition um, with their doctors if the doctors aren't sharing. And Courtney, you had said when we were, when we were preparing, you had a really good example of how you handled this personally. Yes, so um, I do come to this issue um, from a from a personal place, and my two second background is that my my mother's parents both had Alzheimer's disease, um, and she spent about ten years um, caring for them um, in Delaware, where I grew up. Um, and so there was a period of time where um, my grandmother was, in particular, was really declining. Um, and so my mom would go to every appointment and the doctor, though, would just talk to my grandmother, which was very respectful, um, but then was frustrated when she, you know, wasn't really able to answer completely. And so my mom on um, kind of on the sly uh, would call her doctor after and say, you know, we're, we're coming again in three weeks. Could you kind of address both of us? I'm part of her care team now. It's going to be us together till the end. So, um, you know, if we could, if there can be a way for me to be kind of a proxy, let's do that. And so, you know, they kind of made my mom more official um, and, and they were able to do it that way. And then, of course, you all know the sad story here. It just continued to get worse. So my mom would end up really um, answering for her in, in the end. Kathy, if I could add to that, um, and again, I think the best course of that is to be proactive ahead of time before you need it. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. children of any older adult um, or, or a disabled child should have a durable power of healthcare attorney. That's one of the things that we really strongly encourage from the onset. It's really difficult to do to say, hey, if I can't uh, handle my own, I'm going to give this, this very important piece of, of trust to you. But it's so important because once you do that, there's a peace of mind that comes about. So again, preemptive measures, I think, would also be very helpful. Thank you. And um, Kathleen, you, uh, we have a question. If you could, if you could put in the, um, maybe respond to the question, the CMS website that was in your last slide, can you put that in the Q&A or in the chat so people can see it? Yes, I will. That's the ACL website. I'm happy to do that. That's where you can find the national strategy, and, and I'll be pleased to do that in just a few moments. Okay, and we also have that site. on <laughs> our website, the um, at njaw.org on our resources page. We are expanding resources for caregiving. If there's something that you feel that we're missing, please email them to office at njaw.org or to me so that we can add that to our website because that's something that, you know, the more we look, the more we're learning on what's out there. Um, and Kathleen, I was really glad that you mentioned um, grandparents who are raising grandchildren, because that's something that's getting um, a lot more attention. And, you know, I think we fall into, we, we think of the care receiver as the older adult, but there are millions of senior citizens who are providing care, either to a spouse, a loved one, to their grandchildren, to their children. So this isn't only that older people are on the receiving end, they are also acting as caregivers. And I know that um, we do have on our website also uh, information on grand families. Yes. It's called. Generations United has done a lot of great work yes. with that. It has supports for grand families, but it's a very real and, and a growing um, population in the U.S. And well, I'm sure we have thousands in New Jersey. 
Well, it totally is. And we really saw this during the public health emergency because we, our states would call and they would say, you know, I don't understand this new math. You know, new math is probably the wrong term to use. But, um, you know, so they were tasked with trying to help their grandchildren navigate their homework using computers and iPads and so forth. That's when we realized how many grandparents are actually providing the care because our states were overwhelmed with that. They, the states rose, meaning the state uh, department on aging rose to the occasion by providing a lot of training for grandparents on how to use computers. So, but that was an inclination that, oh my goodness, the, the, pro, the, the numbers are more than we even thought. Um, and we don't really have a good number. We have a pretty good estimate, but it, it's something that we know is going to increase. We have people who are incarcerated uh, who have children, and we have people who are ill who have children, and grandparents are assuming that role, especially with some of the financial challenges that families are, are, are seeing. So it's an increasing thing to be aware of. Uh, our educators need to be well aware of it, and maybe some sensitivity training on how we can all work together for the benefit of the children, I think, is something that I know ACL has been looking at, uh, just so that we can really focus on on the people who are important, which are the children, and then also their caregivers. We have a, another question that um, says, all cases are different, but in general, what are some of the common roadblocks that prevent seniors from living their last years at their home? You each wanna take a turn with that? Courtney, let's go. You probably have most of the answers, so you go first. <laughs> I saw this question. This is, this is a good one. I, I think um, and, and you're right, all cases are different. I, I think a lot of times um, it's financial. Sometimes there are, is a real need for home modifications. You know, um, um, I'm thinking about, you know, some homes where the only bathroom maybe is upstairs mm -hmm. um, and or, you know, there's need for a ramp. Um, you know, stairs are no longer um, uh, an option. Um, there are some um, some folks who install, you know, a little elevator, but like these things are all very pricey and, um, and require, you know, quite a bit of resources to, to put in. And that's not always an option, um, for families, unfortunately, and, 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 you know, understandably. So, you know, planning that out ahead of time as much as you can, I think is, um, is a good thing. And then also, unfortunately, I think, recently the the workforce shortage in not having truly not having enough home health um home health aides or direct care workers to um to help people who want to age in their homes and we know from research that people very much want to stay in their homes um, mm -hmm. as long as they possibly can i think it's also geography too again people are not living necessarily near their families. They may not have family close by to, to step in. So um, it can be um, a tough uh, a tough situation um, for folks at times. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think the home modifications are something that the states will tell you that they see on a frequent and ongoing basis. Ramps uh, are particularly expensive and then you know challenging to do, but every case is very, very different. I would add to everything you said, Courtney, um, uh, transportation is one of those challenges. Many times people are in, uh, you know, require walkers and um, wheelchairs and so forth. So that also is very, very challenging. Uh, and one thing I think to keep in mind is technology has tried to keep up with some of the challenges. So if we have somebody with dementia that has Sundowner syndrome, um, you know, some of the tools that are available that technology can offer to help protect them and then also alert the caregiver is really worth investigating. And I would also say, um, you know, also technology helps those, um, you know, if, if you're ill and you really are cognizant, uh, but you can't read anymore, using Kindle books, things like that, that we use every day, but applying them to older adults is really, really a helpful resource. We just have to think a little bit differently. Our paradigm has to shift. Yeah. And, and I think one um, great agency that can help with that, and it is also on our on our website under resources, is the um, Richard West Technology Center, where people throughout New Jersey can for free borrow um, assistive technology. And it might be as simple as crutches <laughs> that you need for a few weeks. It might be, um, could be a used ramp, a wheelchair, walk, a range, a real range of high tech and low tech um, devices that are, are free on loan to people in New Jersey. So that is the Richard West Technology Center. It's on our website. 
njaaw.org under the resource page. And I encourage people to explore. They also have a lot of educational workshops um, because I think you're right, technology, it can be as simple as, you know, a, a, a slight wooden ramp to avoid that, that doorstep, or it can be as complicated as a smart, smart home um, and anything in between that can help people stay in home and help people, help the caregivers as well, take care of them better. That's right. Do we have any more questions? I think you have answered it all. <laughs> so um, we will email everyone who, who joined us today or who had registered and was not able to make it. We will be emailing you the recording and slides. And we do hope that you share it with others because this is a learning opportunity. Um, next week, we are going to have um, people speak for, about Alzheimer's and dementia support, but also on other supports and skills that the caregiver can learn to help somebody stay in the home. Um, you know, as I'm, the more I'm learning about this, the more I'm learning, but there is a lot out there, as we both mentioned, finding that information and especially finding it when you're taking care of someone and you might not have the free time to go and look for this. So there are a lot of great supports and, and places where you can build the skills and learn the skills that you need to take care of someone. And then on March 15th, we are gonna get into the nitty gritty about family leave, the family leave insurance program, respite care, and you know, very New Jersey centric programs that can help people who are providing the, this care that is so needed. So I wanna, let me see, we have a couple more questions that popped in, just thank you. Thank you everybody. And we hope mm -hmm. to see you next week. Um, again, thank you, Kathleen and Courtney. This has really been a wonderful session and we appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great to be here, thank you.